Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Love Talk Radio. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is a very real prospect of a new world order. The new world order does not mean surrendering our national sovereignty or forfeiting our interests. system will apply to municipalities, cities, counties, tribes, states, federal, and international media and spokespersons. All people will be invited to complete their individual believability rating, naming the topic, institution, persons being rated. The challenge is clear. The public revulsion point is nearing the tripwire. There is little confidence in the mainstream media corporate agency partnership collaborators, except within their own visions, goal values, priorities, and special indoctrination. And William, I, I, uh, this, is, uh, this is synchronicity in action. I just talked about my own personal revolution. I mean, my revolution against uh, the public, I guess, institutions occurred almost 20 years ago when I watched on the controlled television. I watched 17 little children being murdered 
in Waco at the Branch Davidian Church. It was a church, and we watched the BATF attack a church. I saw the 50 caliber bullet holes in the ceiling of a, a living room filled with women and children. It, uh, and to me, that was, uh, that was my revulsion point. I swore I would never sit back and watch something like that happen again. Now, yesterday, I announced a uh, revolution, and I also said that, you know, I asked, uh, can we, the people, save America? I said, yes, but not in the old tried and tested communist way. We hear about these revolutions in Syria. Now, so-called uh, the, the terrorists, we sponsored over there to uh, overthrow the regime in uh, Syria. Now we're bombing Syria to get rid of the rebels that we financed, that we, had, we saw John McCain on television shaking hands with them. This is the communist-style revolution. The kind of revolution I'm talking about is a local revolution, as you say, applying to municipalities, cities, counties, tribes, states, federal, and international. And, 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 you know, this is uh, my revolution is based on a pretty simple document that I think covers almost everything we talk about and everything we want. It's called Bill of Rights. Constitution may have its problems with it because it was written by lawyers that certainly want to keep you, uh, they, they want to be able to defend you. That's why they create laws against victimless crimes like the drug laws. And I talked about that too because I have linked on my website an article that the world leaders in the UN are calling for where widespread decriminalization citing the failed war on drugs. My book that I put out years ago uh, showed that the CIA, the Mossad, and our presidents, people that are presidents today, were involved in bringing all the drugs into this country so they could sell it to uh, the people and then turn around and arrest them. So, kind of bringing to light Ayn Rand's statement that the government has no control over honest individuals, uh, honest citizens, so they've got to make criminals out of us. And are they doing the same thing with uh, fomenting unrest, creating a police state here, wanting us to be afraid of the police who are supposed to be our servants? This is, uh, this is, uh, mind-boggling to me how do you how do you see it well from uh, infraspec point of view which uh, infraspec was compelling in other words we had to develop infraspec to get outside of the uh, sophistry the basically what has evolved to a really uh, capstone level of uh, military civilian academic institution quackery, meaning that essentially it doesn't matter whether it's wrong or right. It matters whether these people feel they need to be in control. The, there's a couple of interesting points. I'll just uh, start with this. One is there's five <laughs> kinds of constitutions, and the, the principle in this trust, this document, this trust document, is very clear that the sovereign nature of people is what is over the Constitution. In other words, the Constitution is an instrument, and it's always controlled by the people who created it. The big difference in the paradox that is evolved uh, in the elite quarters all over the globe, not just this country, is that uh, the masses want immediate action. So they really were induced into supporting what has become known as the decision makers, the partners, the stakeholders. So the stakeholders make up 
and revise the Constitution. Stakeholder means those with a uh, financial ownership. Uh, stakeholders, not you or I, we're possibly could be called inputters to already a perfected plan. And in other words, uh, we're, we're not equal. And that's one of the big problems that and challenges that faces uh, this country and many others is that the, the intermediates have made sure to abstract, confuse, and then send in their experts. And this means it brings it to the deciders, people just deciding. One of the underlying and most important uh, theories existing is collaborative governance. And collaborative governance is very secretive, very confidential. If you look into Black's Law Dictionary and various journals, The Nature of Law, you'll find that collaboration goes to a very covert and very collusive uh, kind of a, a, a foundation. In other words, it's secretive. And those people that are collaborators, and law lawyers understand this, attorneys understand this, and they understand that they are collaborators and they negotiate innovative law, meaning it's just arbitrary. Now, in, in terms, and bringing it back to the media, the media has always been at the center of all uh, controlled oppositions and uh, structured conflicts. There's a tragedy in what's going on in the media right now, and that is, and it's, if it weren't so tragic, it would be amusing to watch the media personalities betray their own words. And that means that they'll change sides at the appropriate moment as the sectarian tensions uh, approach the tripwire in this country. And that's happening right now on Fox, CNN, NPR, PRI uh, networks where they're literally in the last five years are trying to switch sides and actually make an appearance that uh, their, their news is fair and balanced. Uh, the believability rating system is very comprehensive, but in three pages, as you'll see this in the weeks to come, it goes into the very nature of the um, uh, aspects, or what we call aspect elements, and that means we're addressing the uh, narration, uh, the vision, the mission, the goal values, the themes, the methodologies, the uh, structure and editing, mind control, brainwashing, public perception management, concept and speech encoding, and all the way into the conversational hypnosis uh, and the eventually into the various techniques such as the dialectic. The conversational hypnosis is used by uh, all kinds of authorities and personalities, whether it's media or government. Uh, the president has just been uh, profiled as using conversational hypnosis. Uh, an example would be uh, the media constantly strikes at the terrorists, the extremists, the radicals. And the reason was to widen the plausible guilt scenario and potentiality uh, significant in the uh, Anti-Defamation League uh, constructions to include everybody in it advanced under the Violent Radical Radicalization and Homegrown Terrorism Act to the point of uh, naming discontents. So it's not by magic per se that this is all happening. The, as the tripwires approach and the sectarian tensions grow, including that in this country, left, right, middle, the authorities push further for force of law. And this has been a long road coming here. So what we're looking at in the media believability rating is literally uh, a lot of elements that go into it to qualify how do we measure this believability. The challenge and the problem statement basically is all of the things that you've noted and so many uh, journalists that stand outside the box have noted. There is a 
interesting duplicity in the media as it grows bigger and bigger to world-class professionals, and that is that uh, critical discourse is, is becoming less useful. Uh, it is used in almost a covert nature. In other words, you'll never know whether someone's actually being uh, truthful to you. It is important to understand that the truth is there to protect liberty. It's a means of protecting liberty. And seeking the truth is no longer a goal value priority for journalists, professional journalists. That has been lost to consensus, consensus reality. Basically what I'm saying is a consensus reality means uh, you can make decisions with no data. You simply say, this is what I want, and here's what I'm prepared to do. Now, the methods are not my methods. They're not my speculation, and they're certainly not conspiracy theory. They're written in journals. They're taught in uh, journalist uh, organizations and, and media schools, and they're taught exactly how to manipulate. I would say that NPR uh, has become a cameo representation on soft, encoding, changing it from, uh, uh, say, a freedom fighter or a rebel. You, you can see how they manipulate the words. The words will go from dissent, or well, excuse me, actually it will go from difference. Difference is treated as dispute. Dispute becomes disruption. Disruption becomes social violence. Social violence becomes a crime, and crime becomes terror. Now, the reason they are in love with their theory of terror is it goes to a state of mind. And you'll notice that the icy Islamic State stuff, this is speech encoding, and the media is playing on it as repeaters. If we said to uh, go into an international lawful uh, definition and tell us what the Islamic State is, tell us what that is. Well, they're not going to be able to no more than they would be able to say, uh, define in, in, in law books, equal rights. Obviously, you've hit on a, a nerve there where equal rights, the way to cause conflict is to push that which is different and deserving of independence together. And the diversity doc doctrines uh, smell good, taste good, and look good, but they have been used constantly to create a synthesis at the global level. All of the presidential cabinet level talks are global this, global that. Today, the forum in New York City will address climate change. Notice it's no longer climate warming. But they do mention in their dialogue, even on NPR and other uh, uh, networks, that they're going to be dealing with derivative speculation, meaning uh, cap and trade, ecosystem services, offsets, carbon banking, carbon credit, all of these easements that are really financial speculation. So those developing countries are going to be submitting to no development, in other words, a continuing austerity program in the name of uh, environmental enterprise or environmentalism. Most of the environmental groups uh, derive their money from uh, uh, foundations that tell them exactly what to think and do and say. And when you read the speech encoding in the collaborative govern uh, governance dog dogma, you'll see that there's about 47 points on it that will uh, pretty much set a roadmap on what's going on with the speech encoding in a believability rating sense. The other uh, demonizing words that we, we're addressing, there's about 80 of the key phrases and elements. And what that shows you is how they demonize anyone who uh, disagrees. And obviously, then comes the uh, plausible guilt scenarios that are applied. This includes potentiality. Essentially, you used to have a due process, a cause of action sort of thing. Now you have potentiality, and basically it's the worst uh, part of a reverse conspiracy theory. 
So the people that are screaming conspiracy theory against the dissenters out there, which includes and is inseparable from dissenting religion, have reversed the process, and it's going to come back. In other words, in time, uh, the, as the people become more aware and their uh, psyche is focused, they'll understand who the real terrorists are and what, what is terrorism, where does it come from. I've All said, let me, interrupt you for, his, let me interrupt you for just a ahead. second, because what I've told my audience is that the whole war on terror was a war against anyone, anywhere that didn't want to go along with the one world government of the bankers, by the bankers, and for the bankers. And the media is pretty honest with us. The the media is pretty honest with us because, uh, you know, they've uh, they don't call television programming for nothing. They are programming you. And I think one of the advantages I've had, you know, they certainly tried to demonize me when I started the militia in New Mexico with the Free American and started this radio show. They have hardly let up on me since. And I wondered, why are they so mm. afraid of me? Why do they have to be afraid of me or they wouldn't spend this much time and effort trying to tell you, well, Clay started the militia. Well, I did start the militia, but I did it in the governor's office. What part of the Second Amendment don't you understand, people? And the militia is well, the people, so they're people. demonizing the people. Go ahead. All people are in the all people are in the militia. Yes, all over the United States. That's uh, auto judicial stuff. the The reason that that I would surmise that they're uh, opposing you is that you are persuading a particular demographic audience that is uh, comprehend comprehending your style and your words and your encoding the words you use. When you look at uh, the nature of uh, global compacts, you'll always see that there, there's the, an abstraction about the cause. In other words, uh, collapsing wrongdoing to the authority of the higher cause. In other words, that becomes uh, trade-offs, ethical trade-offs, environmental trade-offs, uh, human trade-offs. And the media has been very good to uh, and very proficient at uh, calling murder killing, mayhem, genocide, everything, uh, collateral damage. Uh, very careful uh, on the wording uh, as they try to uh, mislead and deceive the public uh, as an audience is the words used in this latest uh, reinsurgence on military activities. And the reason they're get doing these is they're getting a lot of resistance in the Middle East. They're getting an, uh, a level of resistance that is spiritual no different than the jihad that's being executed from here this jihad is spiritual religious and it's going after them the enemy and uh, when you watch the word encoding you'll see that uh, there will be no troops on the ground kind of sophistry but we're going to kill them with drones and we're going to it's a collective punishment thing. They're announcing more sanctions all over, uh, all over the globe. More sanctions. This is collective punishment. In other words, uh, too bad that your family was at the wedding, but we had to knock out a suspected terrorist. So you can see that really we're dealing with force, and the the doctrines that run the operative media are real. It's uh, basically called the capstone doctrine very high level very well written very professionally written and well uh, into a military style manual including what they call interoperability in great detail this affects the indigenous domains as well as those uh, so-called constituted um, countries around the globe in other words the military and the civilian is commingled it's not going to be. It's not in progress. It is. And this is called interoperability. In that uh, dogma and doctrine, as prescribed in its subsections, 
it's very clear in what it says. And it basically says the media will be do this. This is what the media will be. Uh, we'll be sensitive to local uh, power regimes and not to knock out our, you know, our friendlies. But uh, oops, just lost you there. Uh, just how about seven seven five? Who do I have from the seven seven five? With me, Art Dor. Hello, Art. How are you? I'm good. How are you this morning? Well, I'm doing fine. I, uh, I've got William on the other line here, but I just lost him for a second. Not sure if uh, we got him back yet. William, have I got you back yet? Okay. Art, George, it's been a while since I've got to talk to you again. I'm glad to have you back up here. And yeah, bye bye. Glad to be here too. Uh, Williams have been talking. I, I just heard what. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, I heard. I heard William talking about the media thing. Yes, sir. We're. I, I've kind of launched my very own personal revolution here yesterday, and uh, everything that I've been talking about, and talking about the media, and talking about the independent media, which is the free American that I started 20 years ago, when I realized the media wasn't telling us the truth. So uh, uh, I was just talking about that and hadn't quite got into the indigenous links yet so I'd like uh, I'm very uh, happy to bring you up there I've been telling people and in, in, in my studies and research the indigenous people of this whole uh, North and South America I believe were more advanced than the Europeans of the time maybe thousand years uh, ahead of them with the civilizations they had built and I've also when I came up with my whole Liberty Village concept it was really kind of based around the uh, indigenous tribes of America and their whole lifestyle I think we followed the wrong lifestyle by adopting these little ticky tacky boxes uh, boxed communities that the Europeans had. The uh, indigenous population certainly uh, lived more in harmony and uh, got along better with uh, Mother Nature than the Europeans ever dreamed about. And if it hadn't been for the indigenous tribes on the East Coast, we wouldn't even have had a constitution. I believe we can thank the Iroquois for that, yeah. can't we? Yes, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I truly believe that what you're what you're saying is uh, pretty much right on the track. But the only thing that's missing is when the when the people came to this country and they set a whole new idea of how to live here. Um, they didn't really ask us, the original people, uh, how to live in balance with the land. And some of the things that you just said, uh, going back living in that form is is a, a really uh, uh, strong venue that we should should have taken and that we still should take but what's really hard right now is like uh, uh, this believability rating uh, thing with the media uh, even the media is in the dark but they but only because they're a, a corporate entity and they go by the form of rules that they're subjected to also well we're discovering so that the, the whole uh, really we're discovering that the whole government of the United States is really a corporate entity and it's not answerable to the people and they're pretty much ignoring our bill of rights william are you still there with me yet william i can't hear you okay let me uh
Let me hang up on William here. William, I'm going. If you can hear me, I'm hanging up on you so you can call back in. Okay, still got you, Art. Yes. Okay. You know the uh, uh, over about 11 years ago, I came up with a plan for Liberty Villages, and. I tried to tell people that the foundation of every civilization was the self-sufficient family farm. And uh, anytime a communist... Have I got you back now, William? Yes, you have. Okay, got Art George with us. And I said the... the uh, anytime a communist regime or a tyrannical regime... He gets up because I'm not I'm not quite sure whether we're every plank on the Communist Manifesto is intact in America today, but the whole fascist uh, model is also intact. That's uh, the corporations controlling the government or vice versa. And uh, my plan for Liberty Villages was to take uh, low cost structures like a teepee. You can. Uh, that uh, the indigenous people lived in for a thousand years. And with the modern technology, you can put uh, solar around the top of the teepee and have all your power and have your internet and everything else. And if uh, the neighborhood goes down, <laughs> you can roll up your teepee and move. And if you're growing your own food, and this is, this is actually applicable, to our little boxy neighborhoods, if you take one square block and put solar and wind on your roof, you turn your home into a uh, source of income. And if you grow food, not grass, in the backyard, you become pretty self-sufficient. You don't need the bankers or the uh, government for anything anymore. And. Uh, you want to chime in on that, uh, William? The uh, sustainable development movement Agenda Twenty One is not what it appears to be. Agenda Twenty One, ICLAI. These are about aggregate reallocation, community development quotas based on uh, an intellectual level of quackery that says this is who we want to be the provisional beneficiaries. Over and over again, you're seeing the closeout in communities and the channeling to so-called green products and so forth. And they're not as green as they look. In the indigenous world, the earth, the, they have a thing called global compact. And they're moving in to create uh, direct corporate dialogues with the eight biggest corporations on the planet. And they're going to run indigenous country, and they're going to extract their resources, their natural assets, and or bank them in derivative speculation according to what the bankers at that level say. And they basically made the assumption of this, that sustainable development is uh, to effect the quality of life. And the quality of life is measured by monetary currency income. And this is at, at the heart of and so of the Middle Eastern uh, valuations because as they move with a, with a idea of uh, market-driven standards, they come right up against people's spiritual, cultural, and uh, tr uh, traditional ideologies. And the ideology driving the global compact is basically uh, corporatism, also known as fascism. And that means that the individual really doesn't count. It's the, the the doctrine and the law becomes that which is to the advantage of the majority. That is goes against the principles of the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. But in this country, uh, collectivism is popular. People actually believe that democracy empowers the individual. They actually believe that. It's a belief system. Uh, democracy is communism. Communism is always run by an elite uh, and, it, it, to some extent, very spiritual. 
and the history of this goes into the occult and how the, the state became a buffer and how uh, the so-called communal idea uh, is there. There are some theorists that are operating in the, the rebuilding native nations, and they actually uh, are rebuilding what they conceive to be a Russian communism model, which is another facade, another fake. So sustainable development uh, is really about economic channeling, about giving uh, provisional beneficiaries, very important word, beneficiaries, and stakeholders uh, the prime cuts. We, we say this almost uh, humorously that the stakeholders are seated at a tilted round table of sinking fools. And they're all reading, they're all on the same page, but they're reading the wrong book. And that's what's going on in the commerce models on the globe. Essentially, all of these forced migration exodus uh, that are occurring, such as in the pandemic situations, they're forcing people out of their territory. And then those assets, those natural assets, are synthesized into the larger structure, the ICO, the International Corporate Organization thing. The UN knows exactly what I'm talking about. The lawyers know what I'm talking about. The inside agency people understand this. And so you're really dealing with a lot of arbitrary notions of what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. Water is being moved around as an issue and said to be toxic, therefore you shouldn't drink it, but we'll allocate that water to uh, fracking or pushing out uh, or a lot of shale, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of things that people cannot comprehend, but the more it's abstracted, the more it feels good, the more they're empowered to sit at the table, the little round, tilted round table, they feel empowered, and that's important to their psychological needs. And the people that are manipulating the believability understand these, and they have models that they go by precisely to keep uh, people at a tractable level, meaning predictively programmed. And I'm still here. Okay, great. Keep going. I'm just warming my coffee up. Got away from the microphone for a second. But uh, okay. what about uh, we? We tell uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, local communities reacting to Agenda 21, but Agenda 21 is really the ninth plank on the Communist Manifesto: regional planning, along with corporate farms. They don't want you growing a garden in your backyard. But uh, we can have Monsanto, we can have Archer Daniels Midland, and creating food that's basically poison uh, it's, uh, to, to the people that are eating it. And you mentioned water. I think water is really the next uh, major move because we've got uh, some advancement in Colorado, for instance, where they've legalized hemp. You can now grow hemp or marijuana in Colorado, but you can't put a rain barrel under your gutter. Is that insanity or uh, what? It's very important to understand. Well, it's very important to understand that what's going on in the dynamics here. One is that you have rural people, you have rural communities, and uh, they coin phrases like hobby farms and non-viable farms, and you have to be 80 this and 90 that to be a viable commercial farm. Uh, the, the underlying force here is to complete the rural cleansing based on so-called efficiency. So they're cleaning out rural America, and they're consolidating those assets into larger organizations. Nonprofit, you know, touchy feely. Nonprofit looks good, very communal, and, and which are now profit-making corporations. They commingled it through the SEC. So what happens is you're seeing a forced movement of people to the metroplex. We call it metroplexing. 
basically it's a pack and stack. And all of the major metros are building higher and consolidating the, their efficiency. And efficiency is a very key word to a corporate personality. And then, in other words, you, you get as much money out of that square foot structure that you build. Metroplexing is very popular in the left wing. Uh, we're all going to ride bicycles, which use rubber from somewhere which require electricity to make the aluminum that the bike is made out of and so forth. So these are little not convenient discussions that people do not want to get into in metroplexes. Metroplexes are definitely a problem, always have been. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So what we're seeing is the, the rural people, think, think of this in terms of security. When you have a lot of small communities and you have some, some common elements of intelligibility and understanding technology and the various things you can use to make things uh, more comfortable in a community, this goes away on metroplexing. Security then becomes a matter of individual behavioral conformity in a metroplex. And the rural people are literally existing outside the gates. Now, if you look at the Middle East and you look at all of these older civilizations, they had castles and they had conclaves and they had walled cities. Why were they there? Because there was certainly a distinction between the people in the metroplex and the people in the rural area. In terms of security, whether it's health, food, or, or militarily, when you push everyone into a metroplex, they actually become weaker and more dependent on remote supply lines because they cannot grow everything. So what happens in rural America is the farmers end up in development quotas for various things like an environmental reason saying, okay, don't grow this, plow it under, we're going to give you a quota, we've got to keep the market price up. And it has become so corrupt through the derivative speculation system that the developing countries are being forced into the metroplexes by design. And as I said before, the way to do that is you cause a military campaign, uh, you invent some sort of uh, radical force, or you use a pandemic. Frankly, I think that the you're going to see more of the weather uh, where, uh, warfare, uh, the harp technologies, the chemtrail thing is going to advance further, geoengineering is going to advance and is advancing at a radical rate, such as in Northern California, uh, California drought situation. The this is, means that you cannot detect what's happening to you. There's no, there's no source to the fault. Uh, this is evident in statements like non-point source pollution. Uh, everybody goes to the tax base. It's, it's everybody's polluting. Everybody's doing it. And you get away from uh, the point source pollution, uh, such as uh, in 4th Street. The data, the studies, uh, such as in chemtrails, are obscured and prevented and gotten rid of through NOAA and various other agencies that are told, dumb down, don't talk about chemtrails. In the case of the media, which is very important, the media, it hardly makes a difference on which media group you want to talk to. You're not going to be allowed to say certain words. They're going to screen you out. One of the words is chemtrails. Another word would be in Indian country, you can't use the word uh, anymore, genocide, Holocaust, in terms of what happened to Indian people. They're moved into a positivism stance. In other words, we're going to go science as positivism, but we're going to disregard its dark side. So what really the media is doing is filtering and screening ideas, uh, culture, tradition, spiritual precepts. And in the Middle Eastern situation, uh, the war is, uh, is turning into just some sort of academic uh, 
we're there to help them. And uh, when we kill the innocent people, there's simply collateral damage and unavoidable consequences. And it's uh, uh, certainly the media cannot say it's not part of the problem because they abide by capstone doctrine and interoperability. If they don't, they will certainly face a holocaust of problems. It would seem to me the real holocaust that we're not allowed to know about occurred during the uh, first part of the last century and uh, consisted of 60 million white Christian Russians being murdered but we're only allowed to look at a uh, supposed six million there in Germany which uh, is kind of an impossibility since there wasn't six million Jews in Germany at the time. Well you'll, you'll see this is evident in the, the media is very careful uh, and very slanted, very biased, very jaded people of color. Well what happened to the people of white color? White is a color. And in the Russian situation and the various many, many holocausts, always the people are displaced, their natural assets are seized, consolidated, conveyed, and turned into a corporate asset. In other words, to the Native American uh, people, as they're called, Indians, actually indigenous people, uh, say such as the Lakota, they did not own the buffalo. So the buffalo, and there are, are particular things even in Spanish history where there were some things you could not own. And the traditional chiefs uh, have said to me over and over again in recent uh, discussions that the buffalo can't be owned. They're a natural asset. So what's been going on through the green movement is that these natural assets are turned into corporate property, collateral. And they're used in, as debt collateral, they're used as speculative investment, and as a, a consumable in a market. In other words, you can get uh, a $40 a plate dinner of buffalo in New York City, but the people in the Lakota country themselves can't afford to buy buffalo and eat it. And they have to fight, they have to fight their own authorities to get a mere buffalo for a ceremonial intake. And what you're talking about, about this uh, corporate uh, control, is uh, evident in Colorado in the water. If you can't stop, if you can't catch rainwater in your own rain barrel without being threatened with jail, I find something uh, pretty wrong with that. And also what you're talking about here brings to mind a story that I covered almost 20 years ago when I started the Free American. And that was the whole wildlife or wildlands project. And what they really wanted to do was declare uh, certain areas of the country as wildlands to move the people out of it and move them into the cities, into the ghettos, into the whole New World Order camps. And I think that's all the cities are, Houston, New York, Los Angeles, Phoenix. These are, these are the modern-day ghettos. you got nice facilities that you have to pay for. It's very know. interesting. It's very interesting about the water because the, you know, there's water. It's been deemed a flow resource. It's no longer a natural asset. It becomes rainwater included. So what's going on here is uh, the larger consolidation of water and the movement of it around the planet is merely about allocating to provisional beneficiaries who will pay the price. In the situation here in Oregon, what's going on is the the householder, the, the average person is being quoted down, quoted down, less and less and less. Well, in behind the scenes, they've been using uh, the court system to allocate water rights, to adjudicate water rights, adjudicate water rights. But they have a problem. They've adjudicated more percentage of water rights than actually the water exists. Now, what they're doing is they're creating in Oregon here what they call a second reserve. And this means that you're going to have a surplus and excess to sell. The game is real simple, and it's on. Think of this. Southern Iraq was one of the biggest oil reserves in history of the world. 
Kuwait was to the south, which used to be part of Iraq. In came the corporate manipulators and some very covert partners. And in Kuwait, they drilled laterally into southern Iraq. And they start stealing their oil. And it was uh, all nicely covered up, and we got this conflict and that conflict and the bad guys and the good guys and all this. But really what was going on behind the scenes was affecting distribution agreements between four principal powers. The oil was siphoned off, and that certainly caused a war. And, of course, the, the bad guy was the, the Baghdad people, you know, and on and on and so forth. And the same thing's going on with water here. You have uh, regional extinction level events have gone on and will go on forever. The chemtrail droughts are real. In other words, the aluminum and the things in the dispersals that are very heavy are drying up atmosphere uh, zones. Now, in water, there are tunnels that are all over the place. Tunnels. Call up the Rand Corporation, ask them for a diagrammatic map of the West on all of the tunnels they've drilled for water. That will cause you a holocaust of problems, just asking that question. Hmm. Now, the reason I know that the Rand Corporation is in is because they're approaching Oregon and they're devising a method to get that second reserve and sell it. And they're going to sell it to the south, towards California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada. They need to get that water down there because of their own ideas on regional planning. So you're getting a lot of water siphoned off. It disappears here. It appears over there. It's like a great big stock market commodity. And unfortunately, the public has been kept in a very functional dialogue, always kept at the functional level. In other words, we will talk, uh, a good example is in the war and terror, the public is always kept in talking about strategy, tactics, this personality, that personality. We're at war with so-and-so. They never are allowed to talk about the dynamics and the overarching reasons and underlying motives that are causing these structured conflicts. And it is a water war, and it's being dealt with the same. Isn't that exactly what Libya was, a water war? Muammar Gaddafi found a drilled and uh, was bringing water, fresh water, one of the probably the largest uh, re reservoirs out there. He was bringing that to the coast. He was creating uh, more farms and uh, underground river. He had an underground river running into uh, Libya. And, of course, uh, he the, was murdered. Well, the, the, our biggest problem with dealing all of this is we're, we're solving that, that situation a little bit right now. And that is we're jumping around the media filtering and sensing. Uh, censoring. So we, we need to stay a little bit focused in the months to come to uh, get the media back into what it's supposed to be. Now, that's a big job. It, it doesn't take, it just takes a needle, one little needle, and the needle is going to be the believability rating. And what's going to happen is that we're going to break that consensus reality, that fake that fake model of uh, everybody agrees, let's go down the wrong road. We're going to get back to inquiry, and uh, there's a lot of people doing it. Uh, there's certainly, the Internet is, uh, is a major problem for a lot of the people that do not want to uh, raise the consciousness of uh, the human being. The keep it simple, bandwagon effects, community education, all of this stuff that is part of the ICLI system, the UN development programs, the everything you want to call it. The, people pretend that, uh, that the new world order being bigger and bigger and bigger is going to solve all of these climate problems and so forth. That's not true. That's not true. You have major issues going on, uh, uh, extraterrestrial uh, 
events happening that make car exhausts look like nothing. So you've got things that are being omitted and they're not being included in the IPCCC elements. Let me stop you for just a second because what I've told people is that this whole uh, UFO thing, conspiracy thing, whatever, the top secret <laughs> nature of UFOs is the powers that be don't want you to know that we could uh, have lunch on the moon and be back in time for dinner without ever using a drop of gasoline. The evidence is in a massive, even prehistory, archaeological horizons. In other words, the history is op optimized, uh, certainly European history. And what we have seen through symbology, the artifacts, the things recovered throughout indigenous communities, is that the, what you're saying it can be substantiated, and that they, they, the planet uh, really it wasn't you know what they try to make you believe it is and was the the D5E military protocols in the capstone doctrine are very clear, and that is people walk into the room, and I've been there, and they say well. You know, these people are getting too nosy. They're getting too wise to this, and we have to stop this. Well, there's different levels you go after. You'll see in the audit system we have one levels one through five. And the D5B military protocol, which is in the capstone doctrine, has items. One is deceit, deception, distraction, disinformation, degradation, psychological attacks, uh, and thought reform, mind control, brain values washing. And all of these conclude in re-socialization, uh, behavioral compliance, and public obedience. Now, what is important in a contemporary and immediate sense on the, the structured conflict, the war on terror, is you'll see the president using the word, we're going to degradate and destroy so that's force. And the people on the other side are not allowed to get out of their context as a foreign enemy, foreign power, and so forth. I think the administrative people, the cabinet, are going to face their own paradox, and that is a paradox of creating conflict, uh, creating the enemy, uh, we need the enemy. You know, we got to have an enemy. We, we've watched this in my lifetime, watched the enemy's name be reinvented, where the most important aspect that the enemy now is individuals. We have uh, this guy. We have that guy. We're going to declare the war on this individual. And that's straight out of the ADL uh, playbooks and well, the people behind that. That is, uh, that is very interesting. Because what I've uh, referred to when I refer to my revolution, and I call it my revolution, it's my plan as an individual, and the people that I want with me in this revolution are individuals. We don't need to be, uh, what, how did Benjamin Franklin put it? You know, a democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. We don't, uh, you know, I, I am an individual, and it's kind of interesting. I also discovered uh, pretty young in my life, early in my life, that I could not be hypnotized. And maybe that's the reason the whole corporate media, and they don't call it programming for nothing, it doesn't affect me like it does other people. I go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Wait a minute, that, that doesn't compute here. And the, the whole war on terror has become, and the whole 19, uh, Senate Bill 1959, the homegrown terrorists, was really a, a war against individuals. Anybody that doesn't go along with the herd suddenly becomes the enemy, don't they? It's, uh, it's part of the collaborative governance uh, mandate, which uh, they utilize a lot of techniques. Uh, certainly the Delphi technique is uh, 
you're either rep you're replicating or alienating. In other words, you uh, you isolate your target, you alienate them, you expatriate them, and you criminalize them. That's that's a pattern method. It's used all the time. Yep. It's uh, sometimes referred to as a uh, reciprocal offensive. The within that. The hang on just a minute. Collaborate. We got to hold on. We got to take a break here. We'll be back. When we come back, I want to uh, talk about this whole capstone thing. We'll be right back here after these messages from Truth Radio. really going on in the world that mainstream media won't tell you. At Truth Radio, you can listen live or listen to a large selection of archived programs. TruthRadio.com. The truth is out there. If you were aware in the 1980s of the stress the world is in, you would probably have known about the meeting at Iron Mountain, the uh, plan for tyranny, the meeting there 